Welcome to Worship at Medicine Street United Methodist Church. I am Harriet Bryan, and we are thrilled that you've joined us for the first Sunday in 2021, and we hope that you will join us for worship throughout the year. Next week, we will be celebrating Baptism of Our Lord Sunday, when we will be reminded of the promises of baptism, that God loves us, forgives us, and longs to work in and through us. And friends, you will receive in the mail this week, many of you will, a shower tag with a prayer on it as a reminder of God's promises. Now we have extras of these available, so if you do not receive one, or you would like to have an additional one, please email me and I will make arrangements for you to receive one. I also want to remind you that we hope to resume in-person worship on Sunday, January 24th. If you've not already done so, please fill out our digital attendance card. We so want to connect with you. And now, if you have a candle nearby, please light it and take a deep breath as we continue worshiping God together. In the midst of unemployment, debt, illness, and all the hardships of life, we have come together to worship. We come because Isaiah reminds us that no suffering or pain can separate us from God. We hear the prophet calling, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And in compassion for all, justice for the poor, and welcome for the stranger, we shine that light into the world. So come, let us bring the joys and hardships of life to worship and celebrate that God's light is already with us and within us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you made of one blood all nations, and by a star in the east, reveal to all people him whose name is Emmanuel. Enable us to know your presence with us, so to proclaim his unsearchable riches, that all may come to his light and bow before the brightness of his rising, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.
prophet speaks of the coming light of God, which calls all the people of the earth to come together in God's realm of shalom. Let us confess the ways in which we have rejected God's vision of wholeness. Let us pray together. God of light and darkness, we have seen the glimmer of your starlight beckoning to us, but we have turned away and followed other paths. We confess that we have not loved you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us, Holy One. Strengthen our faltering steps and guide us in your holy way of peace. Amen. Lift up your eyes and see the grace of God poured into our lives. The light of God shines through the darkness and our hearts rejoice for Christ is in our midst. Thanks be to God. Amen. The Hebrew Bible lesson is from the prophet Isaiah from the 60th chapter, beginning with verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together and they come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you, and the wealth of the nation shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our Gospel reading today comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, the second chapter, beginning with the first verse. Hear now the Word of God. 
In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we have observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophets. And you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, and it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may remember a few years ago in Washington, D.C., the very contentious confirmation hearing of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. It was a dramatic event that lasted for several days with lots of strong opinions on both sides of the aisle. And at one point during the hearings, Lindsey Graham, the senator from South Carolina and a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, lost his cool and shouted out at his Democratic colleagues saying that they were acting disgracefully and conducting a sham investigation. And then he turned to Brett Kavanaugh and he said, you're looking for a fair process? Well, you came to the wrong town at the wrong time. Now, wherever you may fall on the political spectrum in support of or opposition to Lindsey Graham and Brett Kavanaugh is not particularly germane to the sermon today. I tell that story simply to remind us of Lindsey Graham's words, you've come to the wrong town at the wrong time. He was, of course, speaking about Washington in 2018, but ironically, we could say something very similar about the wise men in Matthew's Gospel. They came to the wrong town at the wrong time. Here's what happened in that story. Many years ago, some wise men living in the ancient Eastern world saw an amazing sight in the heavens, the rising of a new star. And they knew that the rising of this brilliant light was a sign from the heavens, a signal that something momentous, something world-changing had happened. Although we sometimes sing as if these wise men were kings, remember we three kings, of which we'll hear several renditions in today's service, actually they weren't kings at all. They were almost surely philosophers and astrologers. Some scholars even think that they may have been Zoroastrian priests. But whoever they were, these wise men were shrewd observers of the night sky, those who looked for signs of decisive events and clues to the future in the heavens. And so Matthew tells us that just as Jesus was born, they saw this new star rising in the western sky over Judea, the land of the Jews. And using all their powers of analysis and interpretation, they determined that this star was a sign that a new king had been born. The Jews had been given a new king and the lights of heaven proclaimed it. What they did not know yet was exactly who or what this new king was or where he was. Now, we don't know the original intention of the wise men for seeking out the baby Jesus. 
We know that their stated intention was to pay homage, but it is also the case that they emerged in a geopolitical situation that was fraught with intrigue. They were from the East, which means they were likely Parthians, the ancient and very vicious enemies of Rome. No doubt they were genuinely in awe of the star's heavenly sign and they surely had a tentative appreciation at least for the God who could cause such a thing. But it's also not far-fetched to suppose that they were agents of their own empire sent to make sense of this unusual sign in the heavens, this star that they have seen. Is this the baby whom their astrological readings tell them is a king unlike all other kings, a threat to them? Is he the one who will change the razor's edge balance of power in their world? I think they come to find that out. And so they set out for Judea to the west in the direction of the star that they had seen. In our imaginations, we see them riding along, mounted on camels, but the Bible doesn't say how they traveled. It only says where they traveled, to Judea. And when they got to their destination, they went immediately to the city of Jerusalem, to the palace of King Herod. Now, Matthew has already told us that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, not Jerusalem. But the wise men went to Jerusalem looking for the new king. And as the senator said, they've come to the wrong town at the wrong time. Now, it doesn't seem illogical to me, at least, for the wise men to have first gone to Jerusalem, and maybe it doesn't to you either. They believed a new king had been born. They thought that Herod would know about him and that this new king was going to be a member of his family. If he was a king, it was natural that they should go look for him in the king's palace. But in the palace and court of King Herod, there was nothing but corruption and evil. And a new king, particularly a messiah, could not be born there. He had to be born among the people, poor and in an out-of-the-way place. And so the wise men were in the wrong town. And they had also come at the wrong time. Herod the Great, who was the Roman appointed king of the Jews, was growing older. And in his aging, he had become a mentally unstable tyrant who ruled through fear and manipulation and cruelty. In fact, he was so insecure about his standing that every whiff of palace intrigue and potential opposition threw him into a murderous rage. He killed one of his wives, even several of his children, and other members of his own family, fearing that they were plotting to betray him. In fact, when Caesar Augustus heard what Herod had done to one of his sons, he's reported to have said, it's safer to be Herod's pig than his son. So if the wise men have come to an aging, insane, and ruthless Herod, the king of the Jews, asking where they can find the new king of the Jews, well, they have definitely come to the wrong town at the wrong time, and there's no doubt that their arrival sets off alarms all over the city of Jerusalem, because if there is a new king of the Jews, then that means the old king is finished. You know, sometimes people will say that politics have no place in the church, that Preachers should stick to matters of faith and leave politics alone. And yes, no one wants to hear some misguided preacher peddle his or her own party politics during church. But we cannot avoid the truth that the gospel of Jesus Christ has profound political implications. The gospel writers very clearly give us a story that is deeply political. And politics is thoroughly entwined to the story of the wise men. Herod was a politician, and he knew that. 
That's why he shook all over with fear when the wise men told him that a star had risen in the sky to announce the birth of this new king. Herod knew that this meant the end of his own abusive and illegitimate reign of terror. And yet Herod did everything imaginable to stay in power. Matthew tells us that he even ordered the massacre of all children younger than two years old in and around Bethlehem so he could rid himself of this newborn king. Eventually, the wise men figured out that if they were looking for the new king in Herod's city, they were in the wrong place, and with the help of some scribes and scholars, they finally make it to the right place. And they also had the help of the star, a blazing light which led them to the very place where Jesus was. And it was there that the wise men paid him homage and offered him their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This story always makes me wonder if we too go at first to the wrong places at the wrong times to find Jesus. Herod represents everything in human beings and human history that is cruel, violent, and vindictive. And Jesus was not found in his palace. Jesus himself says that the truly blessed ones are the poor in spirit, the mournful, the meek, the merciful, the pure in heart, and the peacemakers. And it's among these where he is truly to be found. And so, friends, as we move ahead into a new year that will undoubtedly be filled with the continued political intrigue of our own time, it's important that we remember whenever we believe that Jesus can most logically be found in the houses and palaces of government officials, we're looking in the wrong place at the wrong time. Whenever we believe that Jesus can only be found in places of exceptional wealth or in schemes to gain prosperity, we're looking in the wrong place at the wrong time. Whenever we proclaim that a political power broker who ignores the cries of the poor and turns a deaf ear to the pleas of the hungry, the orphan, and the foreigner is chosen by God, we're looking in the wrong place at the wrong time. Jesus told us where he would be, among the hungry and the thirsty, among the stranger and the immigrant, among those who lack clothing and medical care, among those in prison. He said, insofar as you care for the least of these, you care for me. And whenever we ignore these and instead seek out the successful and the powerful, we're looking for Jesus in the wrong place at the wrong time. Dr. Tom Long, a professor at Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta, tells this story. Some years ago, a reporter from the BBC interviewed one of America's prosperity preachers, a preacher who preached a false gospel of power and wealth and worldly success and who had a very large following. The reporter said, you preach a message of success and prosperity, don't you? And the preacher said, yes, I do. I think Jesus helps us sail, not fail. But the reporter was sharp and she knew the Bible. So she said, but didn't Jesus die on a cross as one who was rejected and condemned as a criminal? How how does that fit in with the gospel of success? And the preacher said, oh, like all great men, Jesus had his setbacks, but on Easter, he put all of that behind him. No, friends, on Easter, Jesus did not put the cross behind him as if it were some unfortunate misstep in the otherwise successful journey of a powerful king. The resurrection on Easter validates the gift of love and redemption that Jesus gave in his death when he joined himself with all who suffer and all who are oppressed. 
That prosperity preacher was looking for Jesus in Herod's palace, not in Bethlehem. And he was looking in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, the Gospel of Matthew is a rather shocking book. In fact, Matthew shocks his readers from the very first verse of his Gospel by recounting the genealogy of Jesus. You heard Harriet read it just a few weeks ago. A genealogy in those days was traced through the male lineage, but Matthew breaks from tradition and includes four women in his list of the ancestors of Jesus. And they were not just any four women. They were women whose lives bore the scars of prostitution and incest and adultery and murder. And by including them, Matthew is laying the groundwork that says that the new day that is dawning is quite different from anything we might be expecting. And Matthew keeps up this theme when he introduces us to the wise men because these were odd fellows from some foreign land, the kind of folks that good religious people stay away from. The first hearers of Matthew's story of Jesus would not have had warm, fuzzy feelings when the wise men fell to their knees before the manger of Jesus. In fact, it would have been quite the opposite. Matthew's readers would have been scandalized by the audacity of three strangers from a foreign land who would dare to show up in their hometown to worship their newborn king. But Matthew continued to remind his readers, just as he continues to remind us, that the saving word of God, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is not for some but for all, not for men only, but also for women, not for the perfect and powerful only, but for those whose lives bear the scars of unmentionable pain, not for the hometown crowd only, but for those on the other side of the tracks, the next town over, or even halfway around the world, not for those who believe just like we do, but also for those who are struggling to believe anything at all or those who have lost their faith altogether. And so today, let us go with the wise men to an out-of-the-way, somewhat overlooked town among the hills of Palestine, to a place where the lowly are lifted up, where the oppressed are set free, where the marginalized are welcomed into the fullness of community. Let us go with our gifts of devotion, commitment, and passion, all that we have and all that we are. And let us go following the light, the star that rests over the place where Jesus was born, keeping our eyes on it, focusing on it, fixing it firmly in our minds because in time, we will discover that the points of the star will stretch themselves into the form of a cross, and it will no longer rest over the place where the child lay, but will come instead to rest over our lives and the world we inhabit. And when that time comes, let's hope that we find ourselves in the right place at the right time. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we walk into your new year weary from the trauma and sadness of the past year. We feel exhausted from too many Zoom calls, too many homeschool sessions, isolation from our loved ones, and a life that feels out of control. Lord, we know you have promised that the darkness will not overwhelm the light, and we hold fast to your assurance. As believers in your great promise, we pray this morning for all who begin this year in tears, mourning those they have loved and lost. Lord, we ask that you bring the comfort of your peace to them when they feel overwhelmed by their grief. We pray for those who begin the year suffering with illness and pain. Give their doctors and nurses your wisdom to bring health and healing. We pray for those struggling to make ends meet and worried about how their families will survive. 
Lord, in a world with scarcity for so many, bring your justice and mercy for all people. As we pray for your people and your world, O God, help us to believe that you are a God of hope. Give us your courage as we take our first few steps into the future, knowing that nothing is certain except your love, yet knowing also that your love will sustain us through every trial we may face. Lord, hold our hands as we journey onwards. Guide our feet to your paths and instill in our heart a desire to always seek your kingdom. As children of a loving God, we come together in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The word homage appeared in today's gospel reading, and it is a word that means to worship. It has been said that someone can tell what we worship by looking at our calendars, our checking accounts, and our credit cards. And so as we prepare to give back to God today, I would remind us that this is not a financial transaction. This is one of the ways that we show that God is first in our lives, that we worship God. I also want to let you know that if you are able to give to our communion offering this morning, that is a separate gift, and that will go to support the United Methodist Church's Human Relations Day offering, which is an offering that supports community-based programs that work with at-risk teenagers in our country and globally. Every gift that you give makes a difference, and by pooling our resources with other United Methodist churches, we can truly have a much greater impact than we could by ourselves.
friends, this is Holy Communion for a Journey Sunday. It is the second Sunday after Christmas, the Sunday three days after the beginning of a new year, and three days before Epiphany. And in the old song, The Twelve Days of Christmas, it is the ninth day, the day when the gift is nine people dancing. So come to this table of one star for following of bread and cup for sharing, of three days of a new year, of at least four still traveling camels and many, many hopes for the world. Come to this table even if you want to be laying everything down because you are so weary of being fearful, isolated, or essential to everyone but you. Come to this table if you are swimming in Zoom, virtual education, financial risk, or grief. Come to this table if you milked all the joy from Christmas, enough to carry you into 2021, or not nearly enough. Come to this table if you have stopped dancing, even though you are carrying many gifts, or you need to be healed by watching for the dance in friend or stranger, in the old story of another path home, in the warm bread and sweet cup shared right now. We remember in this new year with the fearfulness of the pandemic and hope that it will be ended, not only the journey of the Magi guided by a star, but all the oases where they rested and the people they met who lived in those places and shared their food. We remember a child born to change everything and the endangerment of many children. And we remember that the baby named Jesus grew up to help people in their hurting and their loss, traveled as many roads as we do, and taught us with simple words we can understand and stories we come to many times to find new meaning. At Passover, he blessed unleavened bread and poured wine and love freely. At Emmaus, he prayed and broke the bread, but sent us to find the cup in the world. And so, let us pray. Emmanuel, God, you are with us in our lonely nights following so distant stars. We are carrying our old years and opening our new ones, always hoping for an oasis for each of us and a blessing on earth in the form of bread in our hands and the cup that we share. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on the elements that we will partake. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. May this bread and cup be so sacred we never lose the star's shine. Ignore a new year embedded in every day or forget the Christ of the dance and the invitation to joy. Amen. Let us share the bread. It is the gift that reminds us of our gifts. Let us drink deeply that we may always travel on. And now that we have received these gifts, let us pray. God, we thank you that when the star in the sky is gone, the kings and princes are home, the shepherds are back with their flocks, and we are tempted to pack the story away. This very bread and cup gives us the hope and courage to begin the true work of Christmas. Help us to find the lost, heal the broken, feed the hungry, release the prisoner, rebuild the nations, bring peace among all, and make a heart music so that everyone can dance. Amen. Friends, if you are worshiping with us for the first time online in this new year, we want to extend a special welcome to you. And we invite you to fill out our digital attendance card so that we may help you connect in deeper and more vital ways to this community of faith. And even if you're not worshiping with us for the first time, but you're feeling as if Madison Street is the place in which you're being called to live out your journey of discipleship, 
I invite you to consider being part of our Discover Madison Street class, which will next meet on February the 21st at 1130 a.m. Hopefully, the COVID-19 case numbers will be low enough by that time that we will have resumed in-person worship. And thinking along those lines, we intend for this class to be offered as a hybrid, meaning you may attend in person here on site, or you may join us virtually via Zoom. Information and the link to register can be found on our website under events and registrations. And finally, we begin a new sermon series next week entitled Claimed. And as we begin that series, we also want to invite you to participate in a companion study called One Faithful Promise, the Wesleyan Covenant for Renewal, which will help us respond to John Wesley's, the founder of Methodism, blueprint for a vibrant and revitalized faith outlined in his foundational document, Directions for Renewing Our Covenant with God. It's the perfect way to begin a new year. This will be a self-guided study, meaning that there will be no structured group class times. You will simply receive a six-week reading plan that will guide you through this book, which you may either purchase and pick up here at the church, or as you will see on the registration page, we will provide you with a link to cokesbury.com where you may purchase your book and have it delivered to your home or you may purchase the ebook edition if that's more your style. All of the information, including the registration links, can be found on our website under events and registrations. And one final thing about this study, each week participants will receive via email a special video component that features our own senior pastor, Reverend Harriet Bryan, interviewing the author of the book, Reverend McGray de Vega, as they explore the book's topics in a more in-depth fashion. Take a look at this promotional video to get a clearer picture. I'm hoping that people who read the book, One Faithful Promise, will have a broader understanding and a deeper experience of God's grace and God's love for them that will encourage them to embark on this grand adventure with Jesus Christ. I believe that this study will enable churches to experience renewal as they rediscover that the God of the universe is the same God who wants to work in and through them. And as they make a commitment, they will be able to see evidence of God's faithfulness in their midst. As I was reading the source material from this, the, the pamphlet that Wesley wrote back in 1780, uh, Directions for Renewing One's Covenant with God, what really surprised me is that even though these were words that were written over 200 years ago, they're really timeless concepts. The idea of confiding with God and confessing your sins. The idea of composing your spirit and getting serious in terms of your walk with Jesus. Of claiming the covenant and choosing faithfulness and connecting to God in prayer. Uh, those are timeless words. Wesley was a genius that way. I hope people who participate in the One Faithful Promise study will take away this idea of a relationship with God as an adventure one that we're invited into by the grace of God and that God longs to do more in and through us than we would ever dream would happen on our own. I hope that anybody who goes through it will walk away with a deeper sense of God's love for them and a higher level of commitment to this God who calls them to a greater life. Friends, Sherry Maynard is much more comfortable behind the camera than she is in front of it. But today, I begged her and perhaps twisted her arm a little bit to get her to be in front of the camera. You may know that she is starting a new position at Workforce Essentials on Monday, and we will miss her, and we're in the middle of a pandemic. So you're not really going to have a chance, a good chance to say goodbye to her, although you may want to send her a card or email her, her church email address will still function for the next couple of weeks. But I wanted to invite you to join me this morning in praying for her as she begins this new venture. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for Sherry, for what she has meant, meant and does mean to all of us, 
for the ways in which she has enhanced the ministries here, and we give you thanks for the bonds that we share in Christ, and that although she will no longer be a part of our church staff, she and her family will remain a part of our church family. We ask your blessings upon her as she begins this new job. We pray that you would give her peace and allow her to draw upon all of the skills that she has, that she would enhance the work at Workforce Essentials. We also pray for Madison Street United Methodist Church, trusting that you will send the people that we need to continue our ministry here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, as we go out into the world, may we be brave enough to continue to follow the star, even when it leads us to unexpected places. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours on this day and this year. Amen.
Herod secretly called for the wise men. Why are you looking at me? Oh, sorry. I've got to do that whole thing over because I want to have the book. Oh. <laughs>